Bluegrass with T. Marquis. Thanks for viewing this video. Today we're going to do a video with our uh, partner, Pamex. As you can see from this little map, T. Marquis covers from Georgia all the way up to Maine. I cover the New England Territory and upstate New York. Next, I'm going to hand over to Jay Saxton from T. Marquis. Thanks, Al. Jay Saxton here. I uh, cover the PA New Jersey market. Uh, have have had the pleasure of taking on Pamex in the last year, and uh, it has been a, a great partner with us here at Marquee. So uh, look forward to uh, seeing you guys all in the field very shortly. And next, we're going to hand it off to Dean Hankey uh, from Pamex. Thanks, Al. I am Dean Hankey, Regional Sales Manager for Pamex, Inc. Uh, Pamex is a supplier of Division 8 door hardware and Division 10 bathroom accessories. If you'd like to see all of our offerings, please visit PamexInc.com. This per, uh, presentation today is titled Five-Step Countdown Training Guide to Architectural Hardware. And the first step is Step 5, Hardware Sequencing. This is the sequence hardware is specified. Hang it, lock it, close it, trim it, strip it. Um, so in the uh, section 08710 finish hardware of the specification, if you look down to the hardware sets, you'll notice that's the order the hardware is listed. Again, hinges, locks, closer, trim, stripping. Um, it's also the order in which carpenters install the hardware when they're hanging the door. And equally important, um, over my career, people have always asked for a checklist to make sure they don't forget any products. And I say this hardware sequence can serve as a checklist. If someone's ordering a lock, you may ask, do you need a door closer? Do you need a kick plate? It helps them to remember items they may have forgotten. It also can add sales to you. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Jay Saxon for more, Saxon for more details. Thanks, Dean. So the first step in the hardware sequence, hanging it. So when we talk about hanging it, we're talking about selecting the correct hinge for the door. So what do we need to know at that point? We need to know what type of door you're using, the weight of the door, the height of the door, and the size of the door. Next, we need to know the application. What type of application is the door going? Whether it's what type of commercial application, whether it's a multifamily location, a restaurant, an office building, or a school. Next, we'll be able to determine what type of hinge, whether we're using a plain butt hinge, a continuous gear hinge, a ball bearing hinge, or a pivot hinge. And as we go to the next slide, I'm going to show you a couple different options. So on the far left here, that's your standard butt hinge. As we move to the right, the next hinge would be a ball bearing hinge. The third image shows us a continuous gear hinge, and our fourth image shows us a pivot hinge, which is used the most uh, commercial applications. And as we proceed to the next slide, I kind of just want to show you an industry uh, table, not a Pamex table, just an industry-specific industry table that uh, we use to select a type of hinge depending on the door spec. So we need to know our door thickness, our door width, and that'll give us the type of hinge we can select. So as you can see here, I'll roll my scroll my mouse over the door thickness here, inch and three eighths. And if we have a door width up to 32 inches, they recommend, the industry recommends a three and a half inch hinge. If we scroll down here to uh, under door thickness to an inch and three quarter door, and it's over 48 inches in width, they rec the industry recommends that you use a six inch hinge. So they're just the kind of uh, some types of uh, door thicknesses and door widths to kind of give you an idea what type of hinge is selected uh, in the process. So I'm now I'm gonna uh, pass it off to Al Mograss and he'll take the next slide. Thanks Jay. Second hardware sequence, lock it. We're gonna talk about lock sets, exit devices and bolts. So second hardware sequence lock it lock sets. There are three types of lock sets, cylindrical, so cylindrical locks, which go in the cylindrical cross bore in the face of the door. Then we'll talk about mortise locks, which go in a pocket on the door edge. 
And then pre-assembled locks. Pre-assembled locks are a complete lock set that is mounted on the door edge. These are not common in this day and age, but I want to acknowledge them in this presentation. Next, we'll talk about exit devices. First is a rim device, which is mounted on the face of the door. Second is a mortise exit device, which is which the locking mechanism is installed in the pocket on the door edge. And lastly, vertical rod exit devices. These are um, mounted on the surface of a door as well, and you can get a bottom or top or both vertical rods on that device. Lastly, for second hardware sequence locket, we're gonna talk about bolts. There are two types of bolts. There's a flush bolt. Here's an example of a wood door flush bolt. It mounts on the door edge and is put on the top and the bottom of the door. Lastly, there are surface bolts. Just like the um, description says, these bolts are mounted on the face of the door as well. Next, I'm going to hand off to Jay. Thanks, Al. So our third step is closing it. We have a myriad of closers at uh, here at Pamex. Uh, our first picture shows a spring hinge. In the middle here, we have a, a commercial door closer. And then on the far right, we have a concealed hinge. But as we proceed to the next slide, we're going to talk about closers. So we have five commercial closers at Pamex, starting with our GC4400 series, our 5900 series, our 6800 series, our 8700 series, and then we round out with our, our 800 series. So I want to talk about three of them today. So the first one I want to talk about is our GC4400 series. That is a heavy-duty closer. You'll see this in most, most commercial applications in schools, hospitals, and in, uh, industrial buildings. Our next would be our GC6800 series. It's more of a medium duty, light duty, not light duty, but medium duty. Uh, you'll see this in retail locations, office buildings, stores, et cetera. And then our GC800 series is our most common uh, commercial closer, more so on the inside of the building. Uh, and you'll see these in multifamily locations, schools, and apartment buildings. So there's uh, five of our closures that we have, but kind of wanted to highlight three of the most common in the field today. And I'll pass it, oh, sorry. Our next slide shows our three mounting options. These are your standard most mounting options you'll see in the field today. So we have your regular arm, your top of jam, and your parallel arm. As you can see here on the far left, our regular arm, our door closer is mounted on the pull side of the door, and the arm is mounted on the top of the jam. So that is your regular arm. Our next would be your top of jam. The closer is mounted on the top of the jam, just like it shows in the illustration, and our arm is mounted to the door, on the push side of the door. And then our last option would be the parallel arm, to where the door closer is mounted to the push side of the door, and the arm is mounted to the top of the jam. And I'll pass the next slide off to uh, Al, and he'll take it from there. Thanks, Jay. Fourth hardware sequence, trim it. On this slide, we're going to talk about products that are, are, are put on the door after it's hung. The first is a push plate, push and pull plates. Here's an example of a pull plate. A push plate would be the same, but without that handle on it. The second arm, um, second thing I'm going to talk about and trim it are armor plates and kick plates. Kick plates are installed at the bottom of the door. Here's an example of an armor plate. Armor plates are a lot bigger than kick plates, and I usually put on doors that are opened with uh, carts or gurneys like a restaurant or a hospital. And lastly, we'll talk about knockers and viewers. Here's a door knocker with a viewer integrated right into the knocker. So. The next slide, I'm going to hand off to Jay. Thanks, Al. 
we all know weather stripping. We see it in residential and commercial applications. But there is no secret. Air leaks are common in all oper operable doors, no matter whether it's commercial or residential. So weather stripping is a solution to prevent any, tr any transmission of the elements. Those elements could be water, snow, gas, etc. So, for example, uh, weather stripping can keep pests out. And it also reduces energy costs in preventing heat loss or air conditioning loss. So weather stripping is key, not only in the commercial or residential applications. So we take, you know, note in, we wanted to show and, and show that in our presentation today. So everybody is aware of that. So now I'm going to pass it off to Dean for the next slide. Thanks, Jay. Now we come to step four, uh, handing. Handing is a critical uh, component to getting the door hardware correct for the opening. We in the commercial world have four hands, right hand, left hand, right hand reverse, and left hand reverse. These are uh, shown below in a handing chart that we've included here for your use. Uh, we hand the door from the secured side or the keyed side. So if the door pushes away from you, it's a forward bevel, either right hand or left hand. If it pulls towards you, it's a reverse bevel, right hand reverse or left hand reverse. Uh, I'd like to point out a terminology known as butt to butt method in handing a door. Uh, basically, this is uh, seen or heard, and I just wanted to make you aware of what it is. If you don't know the hand of a door, you can go to the door opening and literally stand in the opening, put your backside to the hinges, and if the door swings to your right, it's a right hand, and if the door swings to your left, it's a left hand. Now, having said that, um, uh, there is a common uh, error that happens, and there's uh, a residential way and a commercial way. A lot of carpenters will stand at a doorway and look at the hinges, and when they can see the hinges, if the hinge is on the right, they'll call it hinged right. Well, to us, that's right hand reverse. So that's where sometimes handing issues come in. So always remember to just like take a look at this chart and that'll help you avoid the error of getting the wrong hand door. So now to the next slide, please. Next, we're gonna talk about uh, this, so we're moving on to step number three, lock types, closure valve adjustments and electronic components. So I'll hand over the next slide to, <laughs> I'm not sure if it's Al or Jim. Thanks, Dean. Yeah, it's me, it's Al here. So <laughs> Good. again, again, there are three types of locks cylindrical, mortise, and pre-assembled, which we are not gonna cover pre-assembled anymore. So 3A cylindrical locks, there are two designs within cylindrical locks. The first design is cylindrical, where the function of the lock is housed in the body of the lock. The second design in cylindrical locks is tubular. In this design, a spindle is inserted through the latch into the other side of the latch, into the other side of the lock set, and it controls the lock that way. Next, again, we're gonna cover mortise locks. Mortise locks are installed on the door edge in a pocket prep. Here's an example of a pocket prep right here. So that mortise lock would go into that door edge pocket prep. And if you look at the other side of that, drawing it shows a side view so it shows the lock inserting into that pocket with some holes so those holes are called function holes those function holes could be screws to hold the mortise lock in place or uh, function holes for say the mortise key cylinder or the level next i'm going to hand it off to dean for closer valve adjusting Thank you, Al. Uh, closer valve adjusting, as uh, Jay talked about closers before, we just want to expand a little bit on the closer valves. They're hydraulic valves. There's three main valves, the closing, the latching, and the back check. So these, again, are hydraulic valves. And it's important to know that besides the three hydraulic valves, there's a mechanical spring adjustment. So please read the manufacturer's instructions. Generally speaking, closers come set up from the factory for a three-foot exterior door. So if you have a wider door on the exterior, 
or interior wide doors, common in hospitals, three six, three eights, you need to turn the spring power up on the end of the tube before adjusting the closer hydraulic valves. These valves act like a garden hose faucet. If you turn it to the right, it'll shut the flow of the hydraulic fluid off, slowing it down. If you turn it counterclockwise or open it up, more hydraulic fluid will flow, therefore speeding it up, making it go faster. So be careful when you're backing them up. These valves generally come factory preset two and a half or two and three quarter turns. You can go ahead and back it off another two to three turns comfortably, but be careful not to over <laughs> loosen it. If you do, hydraulic fluid can come out and your closer is then wrecked. So again, please follow the manufacturer's instructions. Now we're gonna go and do an overview of electrified hardware components. Uh, electrified uh, hardware has become more and more prevalent as we all know. There's a lot of standalone battery operated locks, which PAMEX has, and we also have the electrified exit devices and locks. But to keep it simple for this overview, we're gonna talk about the three main components, which are the power source, pictured here is a power supply. The next is the switch, pictured here is a keypad. And the last is the load, and pictured here is an electric strike as an example of a load. Now, a load could be this electric strike, it could be a mag lock, it could be an electrified exit device, the list goes on and on. As far as switches, we've gotten real sophisticated lately, and we have palm readers, we have fingerprint readers, um, you know, we have key apps, we have apps on our phones that you can unlock the door, but those are all examples of a switch. So again, the important part is to remember the three main components, the source, the switch, and the load. It will help you when designing an electrified opening and to help you prevent missing one of the key components. So now I'm gonna hand it back over to Jay Saxton. Thanks, Dean. In step 2A, we're gonna talk finish. So we're gonna talk US code finish and BHMA code finish. Most of you know, typically the US code finish is a 26D. It's the most durable finish and the most commonly used commercial hardware finish. As you can see here in our table, uh, our PAMEX uh, literature, we have a table in pretty much almost every page of the hardware finishes uh, section. You'll see a US code, whether it's 10B, 15, or 26D, which is satin chrome. You'll see th uh, that as well. But also we have our BHMA code, the Builders Hardware Manufacturers Association. Once again, I'd like to repeat that, the Builders Hardware Manufacturers Association. And just like the US 26D only identifies the surface finish, whereas the ANSI or BHMA 626 identifies both the surface finish and the base metal finish. So as you can see in our trusty uh, table here, our BHMA code, shows that three digit number, whether it's a 640 for oil rub bronze, 646 for satin nickel, or 652 for satin chrome. So that's our two types of uh, finishes that we go with here at Pamex, and I'd like to pass it over to Al for the next slide. Thanks, Jay. So I'm gonna play you guys a little video here. Here we go, now get that mask back on. All right. Clear. Stay here. Check that door for heat, Tim. So thanks for watching the video. I know it's a dramatic video, but this next step, step 2B is called fire doors. And I wanted to accentuate the importance of fire doors and bring that to light. So what I'm gonna talk about on this slide are a couple of rules and things to look out on for fire doors. So the rules of fire door for fire doors, self-closing, and self-latching. When in doubt, check with your AHJ, authority having jurisdiction. Don't guess, don't assume, don't ask someone else 
besides the AHJ, which doors are fire rated. So those are two very important rules and third to check with your AHJ. Some other things to look for are, besides the hardware, are labeled frames, labeled doors, steel or stainless steel hinges, and um, the importance of fire doors, I can't stress enough, and I'm gonna hand it over to Dean to talk a little bit more about it. Thanks, Al. Um, just to reiterate, because I believe this is the most important life safety code issue uh, that, we're, that we're discussing today. As Al has said, and I'm gonna repeat, they must self-close and self-latch. As you saw in the video, that fire door actually did perform correctly. It was closed and latched. And the fireman accidentally hit that door. He, he did notice or his partner noticed uh, a backdraft or the fire inside that room trying to get more oxygen. And as soon as he hit that with his ax, it busted the latch and that door just blew right open, knocking him over. So that's a, with just an illustration of how much a fire wants to grab more oxygen and move throughout the building. So remember self-closing and self-latching. Fire doors are found in firewalls that prevent the fire from spreading. Uh, typical places are kitchens, furnace rooms, uh, vertical penetrations like stairwells, building additions, units inside the building. So please remember the fire doors must self-close and self-latch. Extremely important. Um, now we're gonna take it to our final step, the step number one, which is simply continuing education. It sounds simple, but it's something in our industry that we must all continue to do. The industry grows and changes as in electronics, as I mentioned earlier. Um, the organization that I recommend is DHI. You can find them at www.dhi.org. Um, now called the Door Security and Safety Professionals. They have technical schools. Uh, certifications. They also publish a monthly door security and safety magazine. So it's up to you, number one, to keep learning. So with that, um, we're going to wrap the presentation up. I'd just like to thank Al Mograss and Jay Saxton from Marquee Sales and Marketing Team for putting the presentation together. Uh, we look forward to making some more in-depth videos in the future. Uh, hand it over to Jay Saxton. Yeah, thank you, Dean. Thank you, Al. It was a great presentation. Uh, hopefully everybody enjoyed it. You can check this out on the Marquee YouTube uh, channel. Uh, just select Marquee YouTube channel and look for our Pamex, amongst other uh, videos that we've done today. But also I'd like to mention that Pamex has an architectural rep, Rick Nemec, available to assist with any uh, spec writing. Uh, so please check that out as well. And if you have any questions on that, you can check you can reach out to myself, Al Mograss, or Dean the Doorman. So thank you very much, and we look forward to seeing you in the field.